So um, my actual PhD was in um, was on uh, sediments in Bogong moss um, activation sites. So all that means is that the moths uh, migrate uh, from their breeding grounds, which are sort of uh, which are you know um, west of the the western slopes of the Great Divide, um, mm -hmm. from you know right up in the Queensland, and then they'll con migrate sort of along that 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 ridge, that backbone of of the great the great dividing range all the way down um, to escape summer heat. Now, um, that's the reason why they call it an estivation. So it's to escape uh, escape some uh, escape summer heat in the breeding grounds. Because if you're if you're a moth and you you you, you, you know uh, the bogle moth specifically, you, you um, your larvae eat um, like broad broadleaf pasture plants. Mm -hmm. So if in the middle of in the middle of summer, it's it's you know there, there's no food for your larvae to eat. So what they've done is they've evolved it such that they have one generation, and the generation um, is is, uh, is in larva form in in autumn and winter, which is when you have broadleaf pasture plants um, in the in the breeding ground. Mm -hmm. So that, so my my uh, my my forte is. Is where the bogong moth comes up into the into the mountains to hibernate to estivate. Um, mm -hmm. It's been doing that for you know thousands of years, um, and it goes to the same caves, um, the same the same areas, the same sort of large um, large uh, sort of uh, block streams or, or boulder piles in the um, in the in the in the uh, subalpine and alpine areas of um, you know, um, of the Australian Alps, and um, goes to these these places has been going to the same places. We don't know how they how they navigate, just that they sort of arrive there at you know yeah. spring each year. And um, since they do that, there's a build up of the um, of the of the deposits at these sites, these cave sites. And uh -huh. um, what I did for my for my PhD was I was looking at the um, at the the contents of these of, of these of these I, I, I call them moth peat. Um, mm -hmm. So looking at the the pollen, the charcoal, um, and the mammal hair, and out of that I could sort of have a look, have a look at the effect of um, of European of European um, settlement on, um, on 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 the high country. Yeah, fantastic. So before we get into that impact, um, yep. so these these tiny little moths they they fly from as far away as Queensland yeah. to the Snowy Mountains every year. Is that it? yeah, every year? It's an annual. How, how, how long does it, how long does a bogong live for? Well, a, a bogong lives for lives for about a year. So uh -huh. um, from egg to maturity, it's a you know for more or less a year. So they're yep. what's called a uni volpine species. So one one generation per year. Um, a lot of it, a lot of its close relatives might have three, four, or five. Um, yeah. But the bogong, what it does is it actually uses very specific um, um, atmospheric characteristics um, to and seasonal atmospheric, you know, uh, phenomena to fly down um, those thousands of kilometres. Well, maybe hundreds or thousands of kilometres, and then uses the same sort of characteristics, but instead of it being spring in autumn, to actually fly back. And because it uses those atmospheric characteristics, it it uses very very little, um, very little um, energy. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so the, the winds will push them down. Yeah, let them, and then it sleeps over summer while the conditions aren't very good up in the, yep. uh, you know, for its for it to breed, and then yep. in autumn, the conditions, the the atmospheric conditions, the wind push them back up. So they fly to the high country not for food, but uh, for shelter and and protection from the heat. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So and they have a period of hibernation. So they all, if you right. ever see them there, it, it's an amazing. It, it really is an amazing phenomenon. You can go into these caves and there'll be literally thousands of thousands of moths, sort of shoulder to shoulder, um, yeah. together and and um, just effectively not doing anything during the day. There's a period sort of. In the afternoon, in just at sunset, where 
sometimes they'll come out and, and fly just sort of fly around the mountaintop a little bit and then then go back um, yeah. and then um, and then yeah um, and then and then sleep again I mean there is some some opportunistic feeding when they're up there and and um, there's actually some some good research being undertaken by um, a fellow called uh, Joshua Coates at the ANU that's looking at um, moths um, uh, bogong moth as a as a pollinator, but, yep. um, yeah, yeah, so, and um, yeah, he's 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 just actually finished a um a field season up there um up there the past couple of weeks. So when you when you walk into one of these caves, boulder caves, um, full of bogongs, do, do you do you erupt a cloud of bogongs as you walk in there, or do they stay pretty quiet? Oh, look, that's pretty quiet. I mean, unless you touch them. I yeah. mean, generally what will happen is you've got to, you've kind of got to climb through. So, you know, the, it's not like, you know, a massive cave, you know, like a yep. limestone cave or whatever, you know. Yeah. Spaces between large, large granite rocks. And then you can you can get some areas where you're able to stand. But, um, but yeah, no, they, they're, they're, they're pretty much stationary. You can hear them flutter. So it's almost mm-hmm. like the, purr of a, the purring of a, of a cat or something. Um, wow. And then if you press them, what yeah. you'll see, like, is it's like if you throw a rock into a into a pond, a wave will go out. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it it is it is absolutely absolutely amazing. Um, yeah. And the, I mean, the other thing is, is they've been doing these, they've been doing this migration long enough for actual other species to have evolved in these caves as well. So. You've actually got two species of um, nematode that are uh-huh. obligate obligate bogong feeders in these in these environments, and um, uh, they, they, it's amazing. They look like they you can see them sometimes. These, um, if they're not, you know, they'll drill into the they'll drill into the sediment and then mature, and then and then their larvae sort of I think crawls up crawls up the water of the of these rocks. Um, yeah, you can sometimes you can see them. They, they look like they're just little white bits of string, um, in, in maybe in a puddle in the in in these caves. So you know, it's not just the bogong. It's actually you know the sight, the sound, and then there's you know other species that are there. Um, you know, the obviously other other big species, um, which is an obligate feeder, is the um, mountain pygmy possum. Yeah, right. Um, so are they how dependent on bogongs are the pygmy possums? Well, we, I mean, very, very dependent. I mean, we, uh-huh. there's um, examples in Victoria where um, we've been having, uh, you know, there's been problems with bogong numbers in the past couple of seasons, which I'm sure we'll, 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 we'll touch on later. But yep. the um, actual uh, Victorian zoo um, has been feeding the, feeding the um, possums uh, bogong biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So it's just a staggering story that you would, uh, as a uh, an insect that's what about about an inch long, uh, yeah. would bother to fly a thousand kilometres just to find shelter. It's extraordinary. Yeah, look, it's it as I say, it, there there are examples of other moths with similar sort of the similar genus in. Um, in America, doing the same thing. So uh-huh. um, uh, the army worm moth does the same thing, and you might have seen um, examples of grizzly bears eat, uh, looking through rocks at at uh, for moths in in um, you know Montana and and stuff yeah. like that. Um, yeah. It's very similar moth. So um, there's definitely an evolutionary uh, an evolutionary payback from this strategy. Um, and you know if if we consider what the moth we, what the moths used to be like in the you know in the eighties and nineties and even you know even a couple of years um, in in the turn of the century you get like clouds of them in at Parliament House you know it's um, mm. it's sort of a, le- a legendary thing so look it's 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 a really effective um, it's a really effective strategy at least it up to this point it has been. I tell you I was up in uh, on top of Jugungle, uh last November. Mm-hmm. And I was really um, concerned that we didn't see us, uh, didn't see any bogongs, but I guess we may not have, unless we were really looking hard for them in in little rock crevices and so forth. Yeah, look, we, uh, we wouldn't. What, what we did see, that. Ben, what we did see is the biggest 
collection of crows I've ever seen. It would have been a, a murder of a couple of yep. hundred crows around the top of Jagungal, which, it, does that perhaps mean that the bogongs were about? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it, that's one way to one way to find bogongs is to is at least in the area is to is to look and, and, and find these uh, find these big flocks of Australian ravens. Now, yeah. um, as I say, it 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 would say to me if, if the ravens are there that they'd have to they'd have to have enough food for for that many people to for that many uh, individuals to um, to survive. So there's obviously the resource there, but look, it is. It can be difficult to um, can be difficult to find them. So yeah. I remember my first field season trying to find them um, was a was a little bit difficult. But then you know after you know after a few years I I, I sort of realised you know what sort of conditions they they like and and, mm-hmm. um, and 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 go from there. And look, to be honest, one way one way to to find them would be to look and um, would be to follow follow the follow the ravens. Um, Another way is if you go into these caves, what you do is you look on the floor and you see if you can see these sort of the remains of the moth, so the wings of the moth, um, yep. and and you know this peachy material, which is the material I was studying. And then yep. after that, okay, cool. If if there are in, in the past, there's been there's been the wings of moths and other moths associated. Then that's when you might start to look in the in the um, in the in the crevices. Um, and as I say, aside from that, you might see them if you were at you know at, at dusk um, on top of these mountains sometimes. So they'll come out and there'll be you know, thousands and thousands of them flying around the tops of these mountains, and and that's an amazing thing to see as well. I think even the the bogongs were important to the Yuan Nation, and that's that's the Bundian way uh, was a way to get from the coast up into the mountains um, for the bogong moths. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and you know that 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 um, that 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 sort of um, migration of moths and migration of people sort of meeting at the same time, you know, um, very important for you know um, culturally um, and. Um, yeah, it was, you know, it's, it's a sad thing to think that that um, that that you know that that um, following European um, European occupation of the land that um, that 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 uh, tradition eventually um, eventually collapsed in the probably late nineteenth late nineteenth century. Yeah, you know, I think it's important to recognise the cultural importance to the to the high country uh, grazier, um, but that we can't ignore. The tens of thousands of years of indigenous culture in the in the high country very very important. Oh look, absolutely, absolutely. And if you if you go up there, what you realise is that you know the, the the those forests, the old growth forests, or you know even even the forests that we see now, that the resilience of the snow gum or of, of those old snow gums, you know they all that forest was was effectively you know. Um, was was created was was made through the you know through the the custodianship through the stewardship of of the um, indigenous people of the area and and that that can't be ignored. Very high fat content, I believe. Yeah, that's correct. So I mean, uh, there was a study done in um, again Josephine Flood. She studied them and and, and found high fat content. Um, I did a little bit of work on on the. The fat content as well, and, and found the same sort of stuff, um, mm-hmm. and also a lot of protein. So you know, it was said that you know when the um, uh, the, the the traditional owners went up and uh, up to these um, and and had bogong feasts, that um, the food was very rich. So you know, first couple of days they might eat so much that you know they might 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 vomit, and then by the yeah. end of the season they'd come down and and um, their skins would shine with health. So. <laughs> Oh look, um, well exactly that. We've seen we've seen a collapse of um, we've seen a collapse in, in in their numbers over the past probably um, well you know three years um, three or four years um, you know that was um, several researchers have have identified it um, especially um, one researcher that um, that's been very vocal about it. It's a fellow called Ken Green. Um, yeah. So I, 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 you know, 
I'd, I'd say look at look at his stuff and um, yeah, it's 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 it, it, it's it's pretty stark to be honest. I mean, um, the past few years I've been going up to um, a site called Mount Ginger, which is just on the border of the ACT in New South Wales, um, yep. border of the Magic National Park and um, the Binbury Nature Reserve, and um, and yeah, I haven't. I haven't found found any of these sites, which um, any any bogongs at these sites. Um, at least la- last year and this year. Um, the year before, I did did find a few, but the numbers, you know, had dropped had dropped massively. Um, that being said, I did speak to uh, I did speak to Ken um, earlier earlier this year, and he said that he did find some some excavating moss um, up near Mount Kosciuszko. So. Yeah. There's some evidence that you know, um, at least the past two years, the nice because we have had quite uh, quite good seasonal rain. Yep. Um, have 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 helped, um, but you know, it's still it's still a very very long way back. And this is just in the, over the last three years, you think? Yeah, three or four years. It's it's they've really they've really fallen. Um, I remember seeing quite some very very good seasons, 2015, 2016. 2017, and then, um, and then it's been catastrophic since since then. It really has. Um, so, what's going on? What's what's happening? Well, I mean, this is a million dollar question. Um, I think, I think part of it has to do with um, with uh, climate change. Um, I think that um, you know. Um, the, the 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 drought that we the drought that we looked at, um, especially in, in Western New South Wales, southwestern Queensland, um, um, from you know 2018 2019, um, yeah. was really really affected the bogles. I think um, there's issues about there's issues about uh, water. Um, so the bogles typically uh, um, would um, uh, they 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 uh, lay their eggs in in black soil plains. Now, um, what we've seen is that um, that a lot of water has been has been taken out of the system and put into say um, co- uh, irrigation and co- and cotton irrigation. Um, mm-hmm. So you know it, it, it's possible that that that's had effect. Um, but there's also there's also some some questions about the use of uh, nicotinoid um, pesticides. Mm-hmm. Um, so these, are, you know, these are pesticides which are, are banned in a lot of countries, but in Australia, you're still allowed to, are still allowed to, still allowed to use them. Um, and so, um, all these, all these factors together, pesticide use, um, you know, uh, uh, water, using water for agriculture, and um, and just in general, uh, you know. Um, Drought, very, very, um, very, very uh, long, long-term and, and, and hard droughts have 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 made the population have made the population collapse. What about uh, light pollution interfering with our navigation? I've heard people talk about that. Is that, is that oh, look, really? oh, look, absolutely. That is um, that is a that is a um, that is a that is an issue, um, especially say um, especially say something like Canberra. So Canberra okay. is is along the migration path um, of of um, of the Bogong moss, but you know, um, and and it, and I do think it, it it would impact on the um, on the on the numbers coming through. But that being said, you know, um, Parliament House has has sort of um, dims its light. Um, during spring, so that you know, hopefully, as many moths can safely can safely sort of pass through. Um, yep. You know, and I think I think that I think that's important. Um, but that being said, I mean, you know, it's sort of six or one half a dozen or the other. I mean, if if what you do is you you reduce your lights, but you know, you're still you know doing a lot of um, a lot of spraying spraying around you know windows and and, and doors and, and things like that. Well, you know, I don't know whether you know the moths that do the, the moths that do go down are pretty much gonna gonna die. But 
you know, um, at least at least it's something. At least it's something. Yeah, yeah. So this is going to have uh, huge implications for the pygmy possum, which I think is, is it critically endangered. The, the pygmy it is. Possum? It is. It is. It is. Um, look, absolutely. Um, I'm, and I mean, when, when we when we do consider the the heritage of of the of the high country and the and the Alps, I mean, uh, you know, it's species like the pygmy possum that that I think are, are really integral to it. Um, you know, this, this this sort of this this little uh, possum that that um, lives in these big rock piles, and in winter, what happens is the snow covers over these piles. It's, you know, up near Charlotte Pass and stuff like mm. that. And, and what will happen is there's there's this, almost this interface between the between the snow and the and the uh, and the ground, and they can almost run around in there. I mean, they do hibernate through winter, but mm. um, yeah, you know, they, it, 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 it's an amazing, it, it, it's an absolutely amazing creature. And aside from that, I mean, you've also got other species which I spoke about earlier. So the two, um, the two um, uh, nematode species as yeah. well. So yeah. you know, you know, when we think about the moth, you've got these obligate feeders, and it's not only that. We can also think about say. The, the large number of ravens that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, you know, it, it, the, 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 the collapse of, say, a, a keystone species like the, like the bogong moth has a cascading effect across the entire ecosystem of the owl. Mm. So what can we do? Ben, what do you, th- what do you think? Um, what's the next step? Look, I mean, I, I mean, well, obviously this year the the um, the the, the bogong moth was um, was 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 classified um, as an endangered species, um, oh, yeah. and that 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 that's huge. Um, but I think what we should do is we should manage it as such, you know. Um, so um, I think that you know we should consider consider water usage in the in the breeding grounds we should consider um, we should consider the use of insecticide in the breeding grounds um, you know um, we should uh, uh, consider measures that we, we, we can take to ameliorate um, climate change um, and um, you know even even small things like um, you know turning your lights off in during um, during the migration period. The other thing mm-hmm. actually is there's a um, there's actually a moth tracker app which is run by Zoos Victoria which um, which you can get on as well and, 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 and that can just give you know give researchers an idea about, you know, where the yeah, moths right. are, what's coming through and, and it also gives you you, you know, gives you uh, can update you with um, various um, research methods that that are being used and management methods for the um, preservation of the pygmy possum and, and um, the bogong moth as well. Would a, a bad bushfire season um, cause problems for the bogongs? Is that, is that part of the reason, do you think? Oh, look... Um, Just think getting back to the cause of the uh, reduction in numbers? Look, I mean, it's possible. I mean, if, 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 I mean, if what happened is you, you, you had a large, you know, a large swathe of... of, of of either their um, their breeding grounds or you know even up in the Alps was burnt maybe you know um, yeah. it could be difficult but um, I don't necessarily at this stage it doesn't look as though that might be one of the driving factors from the population collapse if we do consider the what the moths do which is to go into these rock piles um, typically these rock piles you know the fire doesn't necessarily go in there and, and, and burn it I mean obviously it can burn Sort of the shrubs, the podocarpus that's on the yeah. outside of the of these um, of these areas, um, but generally speaking, is you know these you know these rock piles are great because you know they shelter the moths, they shelter the moths from you know um, large changes in terms of in terms of heat and cold, and they also shelter it from things like um, bushfires as well. Yeah. Yeah, gee, it, it seems to me that um, we're starting to really um, live in a climate-affected world when we're looking at bushfires and, and floods and more severe droughts affecting us as a civilization, but but also affecting the natural world with 
problems with, um, as you say, keystone species like the bogong moth having a huge in, uh, ongoing impact in the high country. Seems to me um, that we need to look at reducing CO two emissions much more uh, quickly than what we're what we're doing. Look, I agree, and I, I I think you know the other thing that we need to consider is is which way our society is going. You know, um, you know, is our society going towards you know um, you know more environmentally damaging damaging things? Is it is it is it moving towards you know? Um, Manufacture of uh, uh, you know of 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 weapons of war or you know or, mm. or could what we do is 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 for the future reorganise our society to make it more sustainable to make sure that that the output that we're doing the things that we create um, are are helping in our in our battle against climate change you know if we could manufacture more more you know um, more renewable sources for of renewable energy. If we could have maybe cars that you know um, were, 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 had a had a, a lower impact on um, on on the environment. You know, um, I, 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 to be honest, Matt, I'm I'm still I'm still even uh, I'm still confident that we can that the future generations can can you know uh, do do. You know, uh, do good and and try and um, and um, ameliorate climate change. But you know, maybe what we need is we need some some um, some politicians to um, to become more courageous. You know, to be more courageous, yeah. to be more courageous in terms of um, in terms of environmental policies, in terms of you know making the hard decisions for management of invasive species of making the hard decisions in terms of um, you know uh, um, organized you know in terms of um, industry and the creation of um, renewable energies and 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 you know reliance on the renewable energies but you know I, it, it's for the future Matt but I, but I'm, I'm still positive I'm still positive dr. Ben Keeney thanks for your time thanks Matt good to talk to you again Matt